Hi, my name is Kathleen Kerrigan. I'm an emergency physician at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm also the uh, assistant program director and the director of simulation, and I'm a board certified OBGYN. So today we're gonna to talk about emergency delivery. Are you prepared? So why are we concerned? Well, the number of hospitals losing obstetrical coverage across the US is increasing. Less than half of women living in rural areas are within 30 minutes of a hospital providing obstetric care. And you might be closer. So are you prepared? What equipment do you need? Who stays and who goes? How much help do you really need when all this is happening? And what can really go wrong? So deliveries in the ED are stressful and rare, but they do happen. Just like any other emergency, we need to be prepared to evaluate, treat, transfer, or in this case, deliver. So let's start with a shift. You're working at a community hospital that does not have OB coverage, and you're, you're the ED doc on. And your first patient on your shift looks like this. She's a 23-year-old female at term, visiting from out of town. This is baby number two. She's having some contractions and is looking a little uncomfortable. So you immediately start preparing for the worst and, and hope for the best. So you think to yourself, what do I need? Well, a good set of hands is a good place to start. Then some gloves to cover those hands and then instruments. And hopefully you'll have an emergency delivery kit. So a special note about delivery kits, you need to know not only where they are in your department, but what they contain. So once upon a time, I was an OB resident in Buffalo, New York, and I was on call overnight at the county hospital. The county hospital does not have an OB service, and I was called to the ED to do a consult on a woman who is having symptoms of dysuria. So I made my way down to the ED, and I was told the patient was in the waiting room. And I looked in the waiting room, and there was a large crowd gathered outside of the bathroom in the waiting room. So. I made my way in and discovered a woman lying on the floor, uh, screaming, it's coming. So we got, I got some gloves and proceeded to remove her pants. And she was indeed crowning, and there was thick meconium. We didn't move the patient because it was safer for mom and baby to deliver. Despite it was a bathroom floor, it was still a floor. It was a solid surface. So the baby wasn't born midair during transfer from one, from one surface to another. Baby came out vigorous, and I wanted to hand the baby off to the ED providers and the pediatrician who were now in attendance in the waiting room bathroom. Um, so I asked for the delivery kit, and this is what I got. So there was a basin, a pitcher, and some towels. Not a clamp or scissors to be found. <laughs> so what do you need for these deliver for a delivery? Um, according to Tintinelli, you need sterile gloves, towels, drapes, betadine, gel, scissors, clamps, suction, all this stuff, right? And that can be a lot to gather if you don't have much time. The stuff you really need, you need gloves for your hands, you need sterile scissors so you can cut the umbilical cord, you need umbilical cord clamps, and if you don't have umbilical cord clamps, Kelly clamps will work. Uh, the nice thing about the umbilical cord clamps is that they, they don't come undone. You need a bulb suction in case the baby needs to be suctioned and something to dry the baby with. So it can be a blanket, it can be a towel, it can be a sheet. Okay, so back to your patient. She's now back in an exam room and she's undressed, hooked up to the monitor, and you perform a physical examination. Her vitals are stable. Her blood pressure is 120 over 60. Her fetal heart rate is 140. You expertly perform an internal exam and determine that she's five centimeters dilated, 90% effaced, and zero station. <laughs> Membranes are intact. And you have this sort of reaction, probably accompanied by some of that. <laughs> But you regain your composure and take stock of your situation, and you have to decide, should she stay or should she go? So as a quick review, latent labor is heralded by irregular contractions, and the cervix softens, the cervix effaces, and dilatation up to four centimeters. Active labor, contractions are strong and regular, and the cervix becomes 100% effaced. As a rule of thumb, nullips will dilate at 1.2 centimeters per hour, and multiparas will dilate at 1.5 centimeters per hour. However, there is a mantra among obstetricians that you should never trust a multip. So your patient is in what stage of labor? 
Of course, she's in active labor. And why does that become an issue? Because there's this thing called EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. So by definition, active labor is an unstable condition. So you have to manage these patients very carefully, and you have to figure out if she's okay to go somewhere. You have to have someone willing to receive her on the other end. Other things that come into your decision, how far away is the hospital? And if she's gonna go, is she gonna go by ground, or is she gonna go by air? Now, fortunately for you, this patient has an obstetrician and has the phone number with her. So you make a phone call and have a conversation. The obstetrician is a lovely woman who says, yes, of course, I'm happy to take my patient back. You, have a, you come to an agreement that the patient should go by air because the hospital is two hours away by car. So as you're getting ready to call for the air transport, you look outside and mother nature has other plans. And this is what you see. And once again, you have a moment. <laughs> but it's time to get your act together, so you get ready to catch. You get all your supplies, and you get the patient to a room that's big enough to accommodate a few extra people. And then you gather your team. Now, sadly, my team doesn't look like this anymore, so I now have a generic team. <laughs> okay. So who has to be on your team? Well, you. You have to be on your team whether you want to be or not. You need a nurse for your patient. You need a nurse for the baby. And you need a provider for the baby. And the provider can be another physician, it can be a PA, it can be a nurse practitioner, they can be emergency medicine, they can be peds, they can be anesthesia. Basically, you just need a willing body, okay? You get the entire crew together and you decide who's gonna do what. Okay, back to your patient. She has a large gush of fluid, thankfully clear, and has the urge to push. She is fully dilated. Now it's showtime. She continues to push with really regular contractions. She's doing a great job. You can see the head crowning. You're supporting the perineum and guiding the head over so that you don't create a tear. You do a nice controlled delivery. And that anterior shoulder slides nicely underneath the pubic symphysis. And you look like an expert. The baby slides right into your hands. And you think to yourself, ah, oh, what relief. So you hand off your new patient to your colleague who was kind enough to come to the ED and help out. It really is your lucky day. Because who shows up? Yes. <laughs> so we're glad he's there because we trust him. But he too has a moment because he hasn't taken care of a patient this small in a really long time. But the baby is looking great. You think to yourself, you forgot something. It's the third stage of labor. Don't forget the placenta. When it's time for the placenta to deliver, the cord should lengthen a little bit and you'll see a small gush of blood. This indicates the placenta is separating. You're gonna apply gentle traction and mom might even give a little push to help with the delivery. Once it's out, you're gonna put 20 units of Pitocin in a 500 or a liter bag and let that run in over 20 minutes. You don't wanna give the Pitocin directly IV because it can cause profound hypotension. So the placenta comes out, but unfortunately, so does a whole bunch of blood. So postpartum hemorrhage is definitely a risk with a precipitous delivery. The definition is more than a thousand cc's of blood loss following any type of delivery or blood loss associated with any signs or symptoms of hypovolemia, such as hypotension or tachycardia within 24 hours of delivery. We are terrible at estimating volume Keep in mind that 30% of mom's cardiac output is going to her uterus at this time, so don't hesitate if you think you're going to have to activate your massive transfusion protocol. While you're doing this, you're getting IV access, you're giving Pitocin, you're also doing something called bimanual uterine massage. So you're gonna be having one hand inside the vagina, massaging the lower uterine segment, and another hand on the fundus, and it's sort of a swirling motion. And if you're doing this correctly, your patient will not like you. The next step is medications. Most of the times these medications will have to come from pharmacy and none have been shown to be superior over the others. So you decide to give methogen and prostaglandin F2 alpha, but the patient continues to bleed. You need to do something else. So TXA, right? We have TXA in the ED almost everywhere. It's easy to get and you don't have to go to pharmacy most of the time. So the Lancet Journal published the woman trial uh, it was a 
randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of 20,000 women from 21 countries. Now, to do this on pregnant women, that's astronomical, right? Nobody ever does randomized controlled trials on women, pregnant women. So the patients were given one gram of TXA within three hours of delivery and hemorrhage, and there was significantly less death and morbidity from in the group that got the TXA. So as a result, ACOG jumped on the bandwagon, and they've expanded their recommendations to treat postpartum hemorrhage to include TXA in the algorithm. But all ends well. Fortunately, your patient did not require packing or a tamponade device such as a Bacri, a Bacri balloon. But what if, what if things did not go well? What else might go wrong and what would you do about it? So what if the shoulders get stuck? So shoulder dystocia is a known complication of a precipitous delivery and it occurs in 1% of all deliveries. So what are you gonna do? Well, the first thing you're gonna do is something called the McRoberts Maneuver. You're gonna bring mom's legs back across her abdomen and chest. And what this does, it causes a cephalide rotation of the pubic symphysis and a flattening of the lumbar lordosis. What that means is you change the position and it gives more room for baby. And that anterior shoulder slides underneath the pubic symphysis and allows for the delivery. At the same time that's happening, you're also having someone giving you super pubic pressure. Okay, not fundal pressure, but super pubic with the idea that you're making the shoulder smaller by applying pressure. Now, if it still doesn't work, because these two maneuvers together will resolve the majority of the shoulder dystocias, but the next go-to is something called delivery of the posterior arm. Doing this maneuver will relieve 95% of shoulder dystocias. So delivery of the posterior arm is a new recommendation from ACOG. Computer simulations show that there's less force applied to the fetus, theoretically resulting in less injury. So this would be the next go-to. If that fails, then you can go to your rotational maneuvers. You can push on the posterior shoulder. You can push on the anterior shoulder. It doesn't matter what name it has. You just need to change the diameter that you're using because the one that you are trying to deliver through isn't working. So you need to reorient the baby. And if these maneuvers fail, as a last resort, I go to the Gaskin maneuver, or all fours. It's hard to get a patient who's actively laboring with a head that's out to go from a supine position to the all fours. Um, it's also disorienting for the person doing the delivery. So this was my last go-to. Um, however, nurse midwives love this position. Um, gravity will help uh, disimpact the shoulder, and it may work. But what if, what if it's not a head? So a breech delivery is not something you, I advocate you do in the emergency department. Breech deliveries are complex and dangerous, and we try not to do them. We know that babies who are born breech have poorer outcomes than their vertex counterparts. But in the event it's going to happen, this is an image of a complete breech, and this is an image of a frank breech. Both of these types of breeches can deliver vaginally. I want you to keep in mind that in a baby, the biggest part of the baby is the head. And when the baby is premature, it's even disproportionately large. So your job is to not pull on anything, okay? You want nature to sort of dilate that cervix. The, the hope is that the hips and thighs will adic adequately dilate the cervix so that the head can slide through and not get stuck. So this is a video of simulation of a breech delivery. And your job is to stand there and do nothing. And it's very tempting to want to do something but you're not going to. And you're gonna let mom push that baby out and push the baby out up to the level of the umbilicus. Now, if the legs haven't come down spontaneously, you can help with the delivery of the legs by rotating them medially. Again, no traction. And then you're gonna wrap the buttocks in a towel because the baby is slippery. You're gonna let mom push again to the point where you can see the baby's scapula and once you can see the scapula, you can do an assisted delivery of the arm. You're gonna reach inside and sweep the baby's arm across its chest. You're then gonna rotate the baby so the other arm, the other shoulder, is at the 12 o'clock position. You're gonna sweep that arm down across the chest as well. You then put the baby in a position called sacrum anterior, or basically butt to the sky. You're gonna reach inside and you're gonna put two fingers on either side of the baby's nose. 
you're going to flex the fetal head. And at this point, someone can give you fundal pressure to keep that fetal head flexed so that it doesn't get stuck. And you sort of deliver in an upward arc. OK. If you get feet, well, that's very unfortunate, right? Those babies are not allowed to deliver vaginally. They have to go to the OR. So another sunny day. I'm a first year resident at Buffalo General. OK, let's be real. Buffalo doesn't look like that. Buffalo looks like this. <laughs> Still a first year resident at Buffalo General. Asked to see someone they thought was having a first trimester loss. So I went down to the ED. I was performing a speculum exam. And I had spontaneous rupture of membranes. And all of a sudden, there were feet in the vagina. And they were not little feet. They were not like a first trimester feet. They were like 24 weaker feet. So called upstairs, said we need to do a stat section on this patient, get the room ready. We bring her upstairs, and as we're moving her from one bed to the other, she lets out a visceral scream and delivers the baby up to the level of the shoulders, and the head gets stuck. Luckily, I had a very experienced nurse who was not a first-year resident, um, who assisted by giving good fundal pressure, and ultimately the baby delivered. Um, fortunately, the baby did not do well. But that's a head entrapment. That's what you really want to avoid. So don't pull on the breech, OK? OK, so now, fast forward two years. I'm now the big, hot third year resident running labor and delivery at the Children's Hospital. And I am asked to see a patient who is 15 years old, having her first baby. She's unfortunately alone. She's 34 weeks gestation. And she broke her water. So I go into the room, and I evaluate her. And what do I find? But a cord prolapse. So this patient has to go to the OR as well, right? I hit the call bell. I say stat section, cord prolapse. I hop on the bed with the patient. I keep my hand inside. And we are wheeled down the hall to the OR. We're both placed on the OR table. She's prepped and draped. I'm prepped and draped. I am very close to her Foley insertion catheter, Foley catheter insertion site. And I'm not relieved from where I am until the obstetrician says I have the baby. So that happens on labor and delivery quite frequently, and it takes about five minutes. When it happens in the emergency department, it's a little more stressful because there's a longer lag time from when you make that diagnosis to when you can actually get the baby out. So things you can do, I want you to keep in mind, you can elevate the presenting part. And that means you're going to elevate the head or the butt or the foot, whatever's coming down, and keep it from compressing that cord. It's about at a 45 degree angle. So you're trying to go against gravity and towards the maternal head. Other things you can do. You can put mom in Trendelenburg, all right? Gravity can be your friend in that way. You can also insert a Foley catheter into mom's bladder and retrograde fill it with 500 to 700 cc's of water or saline. And that will create like a giant water balloon and will blot the baby up out of the pelvis and help keep compression, compressing the cord. And finally, you can do knee chest position. And this will, you can see where mom's shoulders are lower than her hips Baby's trying to slide in as opposed to sliding out. But none of that happened on your shift. The skies are clearing, and your shift is over, and you are very happy that you survived this day. Your takeaways, know your equipment, know where it is, and know what's in it. Do a great exam and have a conversation. Know your team. Watch for postpartum hemorrhage, especially in the precipitous delivery. Don't pull on the preach, and feet and cord go to the OR. I know you've got this. Special thanks to Lisa Smith and Ben Osborne for helping make the breach video. Questions? Dr. Kerrigan, thank you for that thoroughly terrifying lecture that makes me feel at least a little bit more prepared. I do just have one quick question on something that you uh, mentioned at the end, if that's OK. Sure. Um, how do you judge success for those different maneuvers for that cord? Do you just do all of them, or are you relying on a fetal heart rate or some or monitoring if you have it available? So ideally, you're, monitoring is the best, is the gold standard. Um, so you would do that if possible. If you're going to have a long transport, I would advocate you do as many of those things as necessary. Um, but the gold standard is always somebody in there holding the baby's head up. That is the ultimate and the, go, the first go-to maneuver. If it's going to be a prolonged time, I would add the Foley catheter, the changing of the position, and all of those good things. And still somebody in there holding Ideally, the yeah. All right. Thank you so much.